And joining me now is Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney of Wyoming, Vice Chair of the Select Committee, uh, investigating January 6th. Welcome back to Meet the Press. Great to be back with you, Chuck. Uh, I don't want to presume anything, but is your number one issue threats to democracy as a voter? It is. Uh, I think that um, when you look at the extent to which we're facing challenges now that threaten to unravel the fundamental institutions and structures uh, of our election system and process, uh, that, that is the basis and the foundation on which we can have all of these other debates. So it absolutely is the number one issue. On the Wyoming ballot, we know of at least two election deniers, uh, the woman that defeated you in the primary and the uh, uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Chuck Gray running for Secretary of State. I assume they did not earn your vote? No, uh, they will not. And uh, I think no one uh, of any party should be voting for people who are election deniers. And I think we have to be clear what it means to be an election denier. It means, in the case, for example, of, of Carrie Lake and Mark Fincham in Arizona, they have both said, we've looked at all of the facts, uh, we've looked at the results of the election in 2020, we've looked at the law, we've looked at the fact that these the courts all ruled against mm -hmm. Uh, Donald Trump. We've looked at the audits and the recounts. We are willing to ignore all of that. And we are saying we would not have certified that election. They're telling you that they'll only certify an election they agree with. And that, that there's, there's not much graver threat to the democracy than you can imagine than that. I want to play for you something. You brought up Kerry Lake. Uh, I want to play for you. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin was campaigning with her. He was specifically asked by my colleague uh, Garrett Haig about your critique of Republicans that were campaigning with Kerry Lake. Here was his response. I believe that every state deserves a Republican governor, and Arizona deserves another Republican governor. A lot of Republicans in the last three weeks that I would describe as uh, empathetic to what you've been doing have suddenly found themselves deciding, hey, party over country. What do you make of those decisions? You know, I think they they are really indefensible decisions. And, uh, you know, I've said I think that uh, Glenn Youngkin has uh, done a good job as governor of Virginia. Um, but nobody should be out uh, advocating for the election of people who uh, will not honor the sanctity of our elections process. And, you know, people who do that are, in fact, putting politics ahead of the Constitution and ahead of the country. I've noticed Dan Cox is the Republican nominee in Maryland. It's been pretty easy for Republicans to ignore him. It seems like it's been harder for them to ignore Kerry Lake in Arizona, battleground state. Even we've seen some even campaign with Doug Mastriano in Pennsylvania. Uh, it this. This win it, whatever it takes to win, winning trumps everything. How do you, how do you blow that up in the party? Well, I think you've got to remind people that everybody has an obligation, uh, an obligation to defend the Constitution, an obligation to do what's right. And so right now you've got a lot of Republicans in particular. Democrats do the same thing. It just happens that our candidates are more dangerous right now. Um, but you have got a lot of Republicans who are saying, you know what, I, I, it just, I'm, I'm going to ignore um, the threat posed by a former president who attempted to use force to stop, uh, to overturn an election, to stop the count of electoral votes. I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to ignore these people who embrace him. I'm going to ignore the danger. And I'm just going to focus on the near term. Is the Republican Party going to prevail? Why do you think more Republicans can't look? I just came back from Georgia. Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State, Brian Kemp, the governor, both beat back Trump challenges. Um, now, they didn't use anti-Trump rhetoric to do it, but they won. And they look like they're pretty, they're, they're going to be in better shape. Why do you think other Republicans can't look at that and say, oh, it's good politics, not bad politics? You know, I, my hope is that ultimately our party will come back to that. I think it may take a couple of election cycles to mm -hmm. do that. But I think, you know, people need to understand they're not bystanders. They're accountable for their actions. The people who are excusing and appeasing and enabling uh, are also responsible for the, the impact of that. And, and words matter. And mm -hmm. when you support and endorse somebody who said that the they only will honor results if they win, then you are responsible and accountable for that. Well, somebody who's been walking this line uh, has been Mitch McConnell. On one hand, and, and I think on Trump, you and him see eye to eye on some things, the danger of Trump and all of this. But I want to bring up an excerpt in a book that Jonathan Martin and Alex Burns wrote. And that uh, this is about McConnell. McConnell. McConnell found the whole Liz Cheney saga confusing. In his mind, she was committing a cardinal sin, relinquishing power. Why, he wondered aloud, would Cheney willingly jeopardize her leadership post by continually condemning Trump? Just ignore him like I do, he said. What's your response to McConnell? I think you've probably had this conversation with him. 
Yeah, look, I think obviously the idea that we could simply ignore Donald Trump and the threat would go away uh, is clearly wrong. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the Leader McConnell and Leader McCarthy obviously have taken slightly different approaches to Donald Trump. Leader McCarthy is embracing him. Leader McConnell has thought we can ignore him uh, and, and go forward as a party without him continuing to have uh, power and authority. That's clearly not the case. And my view from the beginning has been... Uh, you know, we have to, uh, as a party, reject insurrection. We have to reject what he stands for. Uh, I don't think this is an, an issue about which you can make a political calculation. I think it matters too much. So clearly, you know, Leader McConnell and I do not see eye to eye on this. He had a, he had a chance to vote to convict Donald Trump. Um, do you think, how, how much of a mistake do you think that vote, his decision not to vote to convict was? Well, I, I think that it was a mistake. I think it was the wrong decision. I think, you know, the fact that, that all of the Republicans who did not vote to convict, some did, but not enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were in a situation where I would have liked to have seen that trial take place immediately. I don't think that the article of impeachment should have been held. I think there were a number of people responsible for the delay in that trial, but that was a mistake. Uh, and I think clear, clearly uh, this was an impeachable offense for which Donald Trump should have been convicted. Uh, has it made you think less of McConnell? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, he, he and I do not agree on this issue, and I, I would not like to characterize it beyond that. All right, let's talk about a speaker, Kevin McCarthy. You clearly think this is a, a mistake, uh, that he will, uh, you, you are concerned about his speakership. What specifically concerns you? Well, look, the speaker is second in line to the presidency, and at every moment uh, since, frankly, the aftermath of the election in 2020, uh, when uh, Minority Leader McCarthy has had the opportunity to do the right thing or do something that serves his own political purpose. He always chooses to serve his own political purpose. And, you know, that extends to what we've seen just in the last few days with these comments about uh, aid to Ukraine, the idea that somehow the party is now no longer going to support the Ukrainian people, which, you know, for somebody who has a picture of Ronald Reagan on the, the wall of his office in the Capitol, uh, the notion that now... Kevin McCarthy is going to make himself the leader of the pro-Putin wing of my party is just a stunning thing. Uh, it's dangerous. He knows better. But the fact that he's willing to go down the path of suggesting that America will no longer stand for freedom, mm -hmm. I think, tells you he's willing to sacrifice everything for his own political gain. Do you think at all this is just gamesmanship? He just wants the Democrats to do it in the lame duck? Or do you think this is a reflection of an isolationist streak that's actually taking hold inside the Republican Party? We certainly have isolationists inside our party. They, mm -hmm. We have isolationists inside the Democratic Party as well. Uh, but, but leaders have to lead. And when you have the leader of the Republican Party suggesting that, that we can play with the fire of isolationism, suggesting that somehow the American people will not support uh, the fight for freedom, which is the front lines of freedom right now happening in, in Ukraine, the battle between uh, Putin and Zelensky. And uh, the notion that he would be willing to embrace that, to enable it, um, tells you he's just not fit for the office. I want to ask you a little bit more about what's going on. We have Iran now on the ground in Ukraine yeah. helping the Russians. At the same time, Iran sits on OPEC. Our supposed ally, Saudi Arabia, who doesn't like Iran, is sitting here making decisions that essentially are helping the Russians, helping the Iranians, hurting the West. What kind of, what should our foreign policy be to Saudi Arabia right now, considering the current circumstances? Well, look, I think first of all, we ought to absolutely and clearly walk away from the negotiating table with the Iranians. The notion that the Iranians have, have are now providing these drones to the Russians to use in, in Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, if nothing else has convinced us yet to walk away from, from the table, that should. Mm -hmm. uh, it also tells us the Russians are having a hard time replenishing their supplies. And so the sanctions are working. We ought to do more. We ought to do more with respect to sanctions against Iran. Um, but across the board, you know, I think that there are, there are too many people around the world who no longer think that they can count on the United States. They no longer think that they can trust us, uh, that we'll stand with our friends and that we will ensure uh, that we're standing against our adversaries. But I hear you. The Middle East, though, is really um, it looks problematic from a U.S. when some of our closest allies are kind of neutral in this war. Right. Israel yeah. has been sort of neutral, kind of helping late. Obviously, Saudi Arabia. Um, 
How much of a problem do you view this as? Well, it, it's a big problem, and I think it's a problem of American leadership. We mm -hmm. need to be doing more, faster, uh, in terms of what we're providing to the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. We need to be very clear. You know, when Kevin McCarthy suggests that the Republicans are not going to support aid to Ukraine, that is incredibly damaging to mm -hmm. America's standing in the world. It's damaging to the effort that the Ukrainians are engaged in. Uh, we need to demonstrate that the United States of America recognizes we have to be a leader in the world. Yeah. We're not going to uh, go back to... Uh, the days of isolationism, which has been a threat in this country, uh, you know, ever since the end of World War II. Before we go, I want to, on the other side of the break, we're going to go deep into January 6th and your investigation. Um, but I'm curious, you, for four years, you publicly were supportive of the Trump administration. You were never a big Trump fan, that was pretty clear, and you would disagree with him on things when you thought it was time. But you voted with him 93% of the time. Do you look back and think of any moment and think, boy, Maybe I should have spoke out sooner. Maybe I should have confronted him sooner. Uh, at the time, I was confronting him on the policies when I disagreed with him. They tended to be mostly national security policies. Right. Um, I'm a conservative. As you said, I voted with him 93 percent of the time. But I think that there's no question that the, the, his election as president in 2016 uh, began something that has been very dangerous for this nation. And we now see... He's willing to do everything he needs to do, uh, everything within his power to stop a peaceful transition of power, and he can never be president again. All right. Let me pause our conversation here. When we come back, we're going to go uh, deeper into the January 6th committee, which officially issued a subpoena of the former president to testify and hand over documents. Why did they wait until now? We'll have more with the congresswoman after this break. Welcome back on Friday. Donald Trump was officially subpoenaed by the January 6th committee, ordered to turn over documents related to the insurrection by November 4th, and he's ordered to appear before the panel by November 14th. All this came just hours after Steve Bannon, the president's former advisor, was sentenced to four months in prison for contempt of Congress for disobeying a similar subpoena. The sentence was stayed pending appeal. The congresswoman is back, so let me start with the subpoena. i got to start with Steve Bannon first. You both successfully showed that your subpoenas uh, were enforceable. He's going to serve time. But he's still not going to turn over documents, is he? Well, I think uh, Steve Bannon is one of a, a number of individuals who um, clearly have something to hide. Um, you know, he actually, as you've seen, was convicted of contempt and has been sentenced to, uh, to prison. Um, others have come in front of the committee and taken the fifth. And I think it leads the American people to ask, what is it all of these people, including Donald Trump, mm -hmm. are attempting to hide about January 6th? You've issued the subpoena, and I, I assume you, you're going to let it play out. So what happens on November 5th if you don't have any materials from him? So uh, we are uh, anticipating that the former president uh, will understand that his legal obligation, will mm -hmm. comply with the subpoena. We've made clear in the subpoena a number of things, including that if, if he intends to take the fifth, that he ought to alert us of that uh, ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, we also, I would encourage everybody to go to our committee's website and, and read the letter that accompanies the subpoena, because... Understanding what a grave and um, serious situation this is, um, the committee took great, uh, made a great effort to lay out in the letter itself mm -hmm. uh, the specific information we've already gathered about Donald Trump's personal and direct role in managing and overseeing and coordinating this sophisticated multi-part plan to overturn the election. Is the, or is the committee open to his supposed offer, or at least behind-the-scenes offer, of going on live? Uh, television? So the committee uh, treats this matter with great seriousness, and we are going to proceed uh, in terms of the questioning of the former president uh, under oath. Mm -hmm. It may take multiple days, uh, and it will be done with uh, a level of rigor and discipline and seriousness that it deserves. We are not going to allow the former president... Not gonna be. He's not going to turn this into a circus. This isn't mm -hmm. going to be you know, his first debate uh, against Joe Biden and the circus and the food fight that that became. This, this is far too serious set of issues. And we've made clear uh, exactly what his obligations are, and, and we are proceeding uh, with, with that set out. If you don't get cooperation from him, do you have time for this legal fight? Uh, we have many, many uh, alternatives that we will consider uh, if the former president decides that he is not going to comply with his legal obligation, the legal obligation every American citizen has to comply with a subpoena. Uh, there was some news this week from a judge having to do with John Eastman's emails and what emails needed to be turned over. And there seems to be one extraordinarily damning piece of evidence 
there's, you know, some would argue that you guys have made a circumstantial case about the president's um, le- uh, uh, culpability here. But this may be something where he signed, knowingly signed something that was false. How important is that email well, and that piece of information? I, I would say first that the what we have laid out is not circumstantial. What we've laid out in a number of instances includes... Uh, you know, the extent to which the president himself, people who were in the room with the president at the time, his own most senior officials testifying to the committee about his personal and direct involvement. Uh, we know, uh, for example, from, uh, from his own actions and his own inactions, what he did and failed to do while the attack was underway. Um, it appears from Judge Carter's uh, latest decision that the president uh, himself signed uh, uh, information that was false, that he knew to be false, and submitted that uh, to a federal court. So I think it's one more piece that we've seen of a president who fundamentally does not believe that he has an obligation to abide by the law or to abide by the, the, by the rulings of the courts and, and demonstrates again how serious this is. I'm not asking you to influence Merrick Garland, not asking you to influence any U.S. attorney. What crime do you believe he committed? Look, I think that there are um, multiple uh, criminal offenses uh, that the committee, uh, I don't want to get in front of the committee, but uh, that we are looking at. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think it's very important for everybody to recognize that um, when you are faced with a set of facts, when you're faced with evidence as clear as this is, um, and, and some have said, well, you know, we don't know what his intent was. Maybe he really thought he won the election. We actually know that that's not the case. We put on testimony that showed that he admitted that he lost. But even if, even if he thought that he had won, you may not send an armed mob to the Capitol. You may not sit for 187 minutes and refuse to stop the attack while it's underway. You may not send out a tweet that uh, incites further violence. So we've been very clear about uh, a number of different criminal offenses that are likely at issue here. If if, uh, the Department of Justice determines that they have the evidence uh, that we believe is there and they Mm -hmm. make a decision not to prosecute, uh, I think that really calls into question whether or not we're a nation of laws. I am, you know, they've got a lot of issues that they're dealing with that may be criminal when it comes to the former president. if they make the decision to charge him on the Mar-a-Lago classified document situation because perhaps it's an easier case to prosecute and they don't choose to go down this road, do you find that to be a mistake? I, I have confidence uh, in the professionals of the Department of Justice. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have confidence in the Attorney General that they are taking very seriously their obligations with respect to every aspect of the potential criminal conduct by the former president. And let's just have the American people pause on that, that we are talking about multiple instances uh, of of criminal conduct by the former president of the United States. There's separate criminal investigations right now at the Justice Department. I'm curious about something in history that that I I think may have both mistakenly guided how people of our generation view history, and that was Gerald Ford's decision to pardon Richard Nixon. If he doesn't pardon Richard Nixon, and Richard Nixon is put... is had faced um, criminal prosecution. Um, Do you think the country would be more open to dealing with Trump uh, this way? I think that it was the right thing for President Ford to do. Um, I do not think that that would be the right thing for President Biden to do. Some have suggested that. President Ford pardoned President Nixon after President Nixon had resigned from office, had left office. Uh, I think that it was the right decision to make in terms of the national healing there. President Trump continues to this day to glorify those who attacked the Capitol on January 6th. He continues to this day to say things that he knows caused violence. Um, And so I think that that the two things are very different. You know, Richard Nixon, though, never admitted culpability, although Gerald Ford insisted to death that he doesn't issue that pardon if he, that the pardon was was not. Well, he resigned from office. Yeah. I mean, but look, we've never in our history had a president do what Donald Trump did mm-hmm. and, and frankly continues to do. And, and we have to take that very seriously. Um, you among politicians are, have had a unique experience. There was a time you were extraordinarily demonized by the left. There's no I don't time, remember that time. Too. Really? <laughs> that you've been extraordinarily demonized by the right. What has that what has that experience been like for you? Look, I think that uh, we have to deal with sort of the facts that are in front of us. And my view is the job that I have to do right now and that I have had to do, especially since January 6th, is so important that that really is my focus. Um, I think that that we have seen across the country, we've certainly seen on our committee, a coming together of people despite partisan differences and policy differences to say, look, 
the most important issue is the defense of the republic, and we have to do that on a nonpartisan basis. I've been extremely uh, disappointed uh, and very sad by the response to the vast majority of my colleagues on the Republican side to this. Yeah. I really believed, growing up in the family that I grew up in, that you know when the chips were down, people would do the right thing. And it turns out that not very many people do. You have said you're going to do whatever it takes to stop Donald Trump from getting back to that Oval, oval Office. Define whatever it takes. Look, uh, there are very few certainties in politics. Um, but one thing that you can absolutely count on is that uh, there are tens of millions of Americans who will do uh, everything we need to do to make sure Donald Trump is never the president again. Uh, the threat that he poses is too great. Uh, he's demonstrated his willingness to use force to attempt to stop the peaceful transition of power. And there are simply many, many millions more Americans who... Uh, despite any party affiliation, understand how dangerous that is and will make sure he's never in the Oval Office again. How do you um, bring this country together, though? Because as I said, you've both had a unique experience in seeing when partisan hatred, partisan anger directed at you individually. And you, we see this divide. You see it in our own polling. And it, it seems very difficult. How would you try to bridge this divide? Uh, to a national audience. You know, I I experience a unity uh, every every day as I travel around the country, uh, as I work with colleagues on Capitol Hill. Uh, there are uh, responsible and rational and sane people uh, in both parties mm -hmm. who want what's best for our country and who want to elect politicians who are going to do the right thing. Uh, who want to see elected officials engage on the basis of substance and policy differences, not not minimize those differences, but but really engage on the basis of that. Um, and and so I, I've been very heartened by the unity that I've seen. Uh, so many people who understand we have to say stop. We yeah. cannot go over this abyss, and and we have to come together to solve the great challenges our nation faces. Donald Trump ends up the nominee in 2024. You've said you're not going to be a Republican anymore. So it implies you think the Republican Party can be saved. I think that the um, party has either got to come back from where we are right now, which is a very dangerous and toxic place, or the party will splinter and there will be a new conservative party that rises. And if Donald Trump is the nominee of the Republican Party, the party will shatter uh, and there will be a conservative party that rises in its place. I was with the voter group this week um, who both were exhausted by the January 6th committee and wanted to see you run for president. Um, what would it take to get you to run for president? Look, I'm, I am uh, going to be very focused on all of the things that we've been talking about. And, and I, I care deeply, uh, as I know you do, uh, as, as millions of people do, about this nation and, mm -hmm. and about the blessing that we have as a constitutional republic. And so, uh, you know, whether that means helping other candidates, whether mm -hmm. it means helping to educate people around the country, I have been on a number of college campuses and am very inspired by those young people. Yeah. But I I'm, I'm focused on what we've got to do to save the country from this very dangerous moment we're in, um, you know, not right now on, on whether I'm going to be a candidate or not. There's some people suggest if you were a third party candidate, it would be enough to stop Trump. Well, we will do whatever it takes. As I said, he will not be the president of the United States again. Before I let you go, this investigation has an expiration date if Republicans take control of Congress. Um, there's no report out yet before the election. I, I know you, on one hand, want to take politics out of it, but shouldn't this be on the ballot? Shouldn't the decision whether this investigation continues be on the ballot in November? Look, I, I think it's very important to take politics out of it. Uh, the committee is investigating and proceeding in a way that is not partisan uh, mm -hmm. at all. Um, I think that as people go in to vote, they need to recognize that there are certain candidates who are anti-democracy. They need to recognize that election deniers are anti-democracy, and mm -hmm. they should not vote for those people. Where does this investigation go on January 4th? Well, um, you know, if we were in a nation where uh, our politics were operating the way they should, the investigation would, would proceed no matter what. I think that the Republicans have made very clear that they're not interested in getting to the bottom of what happened or holding people to account. And I think that also ought to be something that, that Americans across the country are paying attention to. Why would you not want to understand yeah. how this happened? Congresswoman Liz Cheney, believe it or not, I still have questions for you, but I am out of time. Well, it's thank you for all the time. time. I appreciate it. Right. Thanks and for having safe, me, Jack. Stay safe on the trail. Thank you so much. You Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.